join me in giving a big Christian life welcome to Pastor Derek Owen. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for the warm welcome. It's good to see all of you here today. Turn to your neighbor, tell them they look good. Now look to your second choice neighbor and tell them they look good too. Good, good, good. Well, it's great to be with you. I have been, me and my wife have been longtime friends of your pastors, Brian and Cindy. Brian and Cindy moved to Clovis, New Mexico when Josh was six weeks old. That's how long we've been friends. And so we have known them through a lot of phases of life and it's so incredible to see them here and leading like they are. How many of you just love your pastors? Come on, give it up. Give it up for your pastors today. They're fantastic. We love them so much. I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of Josh and Nathan and their, their journeys and all that they've got going on. It's good to see a family who loves Jesus. And that's, that's difficult sometimes. In ministry, how many of you understand that? Because the kids see the ugly side of ministry. Because they hear all the conversations about you. Smile at me. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they still love you. They honor you. And I'm so proud of Brian and Cindy. So proud of this church. And you guys, I don't know when it's going to happen, but y'all have got to go to two services soon. Come on, everybody, because in order to reach the city, we've got to have some room. Yes, and to make room is a sacrifice even for you, and I just applaud all that you're doing. Thank you so much for serving in the way that you are, loving the city of Santa Fe. It's an amazing place, and uh, we are, we're just, I'm thrilled to be here this morning. My wife isn't able to be with me this morning because she's serving in kids' church back at Harvest in Albuquerque. And uh, we one thing that, that we learned is, and I'm going to be talking about this today, in ministry, you've got to be good at more than one seat. You've got to be able to lead from more than where you're comfortable. And, and we've just made that a practice of our lives. And so we serve in different areas of the church. And it's just a, a privilege to do so. Would you take your Bibles out this morning? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into the Word today. I'm going to, I'm going to be in Exodus chapter 4. If I can get my iPad to wake up here. Here we go. Exodus 4. And I'm, I'm going to share a message with you that I've simply titled, What's in Your Hand? What's in Your Hand? Exodus chapter 4, verse 2 says, what's in your hand? So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. God tell, is telling, he's having a conversation with Moses, right? He says, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. So I would too, how about you? Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where I believe Moses became a stutterer. Right? Take it by the tail. Right? This is where it happened. This is pick it up by the tail. Pick it up by the tail. What, what God was saying, you handle the little things and I'll handle the big stuff. How many of you understand God can handle the big stuff? You handle the little end, I'll handle the business end. You handle the things that you can take care of, I'll watch out for the danger. How many trust God? Do what you can do, God will do what he can do. And God can do what we can't do. How many of you understand that? Verse 4, continue reading, and he reached out his hand and he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're so honored, Lord, to be in your house. 
God, this morning we declare your word over our lives and over our city. God, we declare your word over this church. We know that your hand is upon it. We see the fruit that is taking place within it. So God, I just ask that you would allow us all to take a firm grasp of the desire that you have for us. That you would allow us to step into ministry at a greater level than we've ever been. As individuals and collectively, that we may minister to this city and to this world that you've called us to reach. God, it's an honor to declare your word today. In the strong, matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen? Amen. God had declared... God had declared, I'm ready to bring my people out of bondage. They've been in bondage for how long? 400 years. They've been in slavery for a long, long time. And God's saying, I'm ready to release a harvest upon your life like you've never seen before. I'm ready to use you in ministry. I'm ready to to allow you to be a part of the plan. And Moses was God's choice. I want you to understand this. God always raises leaders. God will always use leaders to accomplish the goal that is in his in, in his heart for that situation. And let me tell you something. All of you have the leadership capacity that God has placed within you. All of us can be leaders. God wanted to bring them out of slavery. God wanted to set them up. But instead of surrender, what happens? Moses had ran. Moses had ran. Write this down if you're going to take some notes this morning. When we run from surrender, we are left with the outcome of our own choices. When we run from surrender, we're simply going to have the outcome of our own choices. And he ran into the desert for 40 years with a suntan, sandals, and a stick. That's what he finds himself out there with. And he begins to herd sheep. He begins to take care of these sheep. But according to scripture, he was really running from his calling. I'm here to tell somebody today, I believe the Spirit of God wants to wake somebody up and say, stop running from the calling that God has on your life. To bring you into a desire to to knit your heart with God's and understand that what God has already spoken to you, he will bring to pass, but you've got to quit running. Moses ran. I hope we stop running today. Come on, everybody. How many of you like to run? Can I tell you something? If you see me running, something's wrong. Because there's better ways. Right? We live in a modern world. There is no need to run. Come on, everybody. I always tell my kids, I wonder what they're running from. My son was confused for a long time. Finally, he got it. <laughs> Moses, for Moses, when God tells him at the, at the burning bush, take your shoes off. He's saying, quit running. Quit running from your calling. You let fear stop you. You've let fear intimidate you. Stop that. Stop the running. And God is saying then, and I believe he's saying today, I don't want you to run from it. I want you to run to it. I don't want you to run from what God has for you. I want you to run to what he has for you. Come on, everybody. Moses was full of fear, and I understand. When God called me to preach, I was scared to death. I still get nervous, right? I still get jittery. I've preached thousands of messages and I still get get a little antsy. Why? Because this is not natural for me. This is something that I've had to overcome. In fact, in college, my, my first public speaking class in college, when it was my turn to speak, it was Eastern New Mexico University, and they have this, this big stadium kind of seating, and I was up about three quarters of the way, and they called my name, and I had, I had prepared, I had done the work. I walked down the steps, and I turned, and I walked straight out of the door. I'm like, nope, not going to happen. Not going to happen. See, I went to to school to be a coach. 
I coached football, I coached high school, and I was going to coach. But God said, son, I have different plans for you. I do want you to coach, and I want you to coach people. It's just not going to be on that field anymore. It was intimidating. I could have let fear stop me. I will tell you, there was times that I have let fear stop me. How about you? Here we have God asking Moses, Moses, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? He said, Lord, it's just a stick. All it is is a stick. It's a simple, average, ordinary stick. God said, throw it down. I wish I'd have brought a stick this morning. Could have thrown it down. He threw it down, and when he did, the supernatural hit that stick. Come on, somebody. And that which was normal, that which was common, that which was ordinary, began to have a supernatural component on it, and it was miraculous. How many of you know that if I walked out here with, with a stick, it wouldn't be that big of a deal? Right? Not that big of a deal. But if I walked out here with a real life snake in my hand, some of you would think, this ain't my kind of church. <laughs> Mine either. Those people are crazy. Something's wrong. Right? But God took the ordinary, listen to me, and made it sensational. And then he said, pick it up by the tail. Moses, pick it up. Now you know God's a little crazy. Right? He said, pick it up by the tail. He's saying, I don't want you to run from it. I want you to pick it up. I want you to embrace it. I want you to trust me to fulfill the calling, ladies and gentlemen, that God has on your life. You're going to have to confront some things. You're going to have to confront some fears. You're going to have to step in. God will ask you to confront that which is holding you back. You're never going to make progress if you won't confront what's holding you back. And now's the time to do that. Now's the time. I love being able to, to speak in churches. and such a, a privilege to be able to serve in this capacity across our churches in New Mexico and the Assemblies of God churches. And, and it's, it's such a rich joy that I have every week, it seems, lately, to be able to speak into a different church. And, and I'm, just, I'm just telling you, God's up to something right now. There are churches that are like yours right now that God has just brought a lot of people and, and it's just infiltrating the church with people who are, who are hungry to do something and to see something, experience something. And I believe this church and the capacity within it is far larger than any of you or even your pastors have dreamed about. There's no doubt in my mind that this church soon will be times bigger than it even is now. Come on, everybody. Why is that important? Why is that important that, it's, that it grows? Why is it important that the church grows? Because there are lost souls out there that need Jesus. But if we don't do what we're called to do, they'll never be able to hear what we've heard. Right, somebody? I got so many things rolling through my head. I don't want to, have to keep you here all day, but I hope you packed a lunch anyhow. If not, we'll serve you enough of those mints in the lobby to hold you over. How many of you have ever had the fear of failure hold you back? Just the fear of failure. Just the fear that if, if, if I start, it won't go that well. Can I encourage you to start? You know, if you never took a step, you'd still be scooting around on your backside, walking around on your knees. You fell down a lot of times, but here you are, upright, making progress. Come on, somebody. That stick, that stick looks so common, so ordinary, so average. It suddenly became supernatural. Moses, Moses understood that God had given him something powerful and then he threw it down. God said, pick it back up. And when he did, 
He turned back into a stick. It was a stick in his hand. He threw it down. God turned it into a snake. Moses picked it back up. It became a stick again. What is God saying to him? What is he saying to us today? Look at your neighbor and say this. Sometimes all God needs is a stick. God wasn't depending on Moses' wisdom. That's what keeps a lot of us stopping from, from, from moving out, right? We stop short right there. Listen, you can always get wisdom when you apply yourself. But when God chooses you to do something, it's not depending. It's not dependent about what's in your head. It's not dependent upon that. He didn't say, Moses, what's in your mouth? Because the miracle wasn't dependent on what Moses' ability to communicate was. God can give you skills. God can allow you to develop your skills in any area. Trust me on that. But God is saying, all I need from you to develop is, is for you to be able to be useful with what you already have. All I need is who you are. All I need is who you are. Get your fingerprints off of it, and it will transform into something powerful. Come on, everybody. All God needs is a stick. He doesn't need a super talented, super good looking. He doesn't need somebody that's sensational and that can wow the crowd. He doesn't need that. Will he use that? Sure he will. But will he use the average, the ordinary, the mundane? Will he use, will he use the common? Yes, he will. Will he use you? That's the question. That's the question. God is going to do a miracle. All he needs sometimes is a stick. So we read in Exodus chapter 4. What about Exodus 14? In Exodus 14, when God says it's time to part the Red Sea, all Moses did was hold up a what? He holds up a stick in his hand and the sea parts. Some of you are like, that's no average, ordinary stick, Pastor Derek. I don't understand. An entire Egyptian army drowns in the sea because sometimes all God needs is a stick. Exodus 15, when they were at the bitter waters of Marah and all the Israelites were thirsty, as unto death. Right? It had been a long journey. It had been a hot journey. They needed a drink. And they come to this place and all the water there to drink is bitter. It's bitter. Living in Tucumcari for the last 23 years, out in the Quay Valley, some of the ranchers that live out there have to haul every drop of water that their cattle drink. Because the water that they pump out of the ground is so salty and so bitter that not even the livestock will drink it. I've seen a coyote turn his nose to water. But here in Exodus 15, God brings them to this place. God brings them to a place that upon first glance looks like he supplied to them exactly what they needed until they took a drink of it. Can you imagine them all spitting it out? Oh! And the grumbling and complaining started again. These people were good at that. The Bible testifies over and over again of how, how much that they complain. But once again, God says to Moses, there's a tree, cut off a limb and touch the bitter water with that tree. Because all he needed was a stick and suddenly the bitter water became sweet and suddenly they had water and it kept them alive it kept them moving because God doesn't need something sensational sometimes he just needs a stick first Kings 17 when the widow woman was about to eat her last meal and the prophet Elijah showed up and said I need you to make me a meal I think we often overlook the gravity of that situation. She didn't have extra flour. She didn't have any extra to feed 
the extras that showed up at the house. She didn't have ex- but but she she what did she do anyway? She made him a cake. She made him a meal. She made him. She did for him what she couldn't even do for herself. Come on, church. The Bible says she went outside and began gathering sticks. Because sometimes for God to do the supernatural thing, he doesn't need a showboat. He doesn't need somebody with an over over um, a, a, an overabundance of provision. He doesn't need someone that's got all the supply in the world. All he needs is the average, ordinary person that will give him what is in their hand. Second Kings chapter six. They're building the school of the prophets, and an axe head flies off the axe, and it falls into the river. And the building program stops. They don't have an axe head. They cannot now, they can't chop wood to get wood for lumber to continue to build the building project that they had. How many of you know our building projects would slow also if we had to use an axe to begin with? I get irritated when the lump, the load of lumber that I ordered didn't show up on time. Come on, somebody. God said, go get a stick and touch the water of the Jordan. And your Bible says that the axe head did the backstroke across the top of the water. And it swam in the Jordan. Maybe taking a little bit of license, maybe not a backstroke. But the, the axe head floated because sometimes God needs an ordinary average stick. Somebody, look at me. Quit saying you're average. Quit saying you're ordinary. Quit saying you're not talented enough. Stop saying you can't speak. Stop saying that you don't have enough in your hand. Stop saying those things because God will use exactly who you are to touch a world around you because he's put you in it to establish that his plan and his love for them is within you. The reason I didn't preach this sermon is because it's my testimony. I can't believe what I get to do week in, week out. It still boggles my mind that this is what I get to do. But I learned a long time ago that God doesn't need anything else. When God uses me, he gets the glory. I don't. Acts 28. God wanted to reach a a bunch of barbarians on a prison island. He washes up. The Apostle Paul from a shipwreck. And the Bible says he starts gathering sticks to build a fire. And a snake bites him on the hand. And he doesn't die. They said, what do you have to say? And he preaches the gospel to them. All because God is able to use anybody. Come on church. He's able to use anyone. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when God got ready to reach a lost and dying world, he took a stick and he planted it in the ground. And he took another stick and he made a cross out of it. And he hung his son on two sticks because God needed was a stick. He didn't need anything beautiful. He didn't need anything else. There was beauty. There's no beauty in Jesus, the Bible says. He's an ordinary man. He'd not come as a king. He'd come as a baby, a lowly servant, washing the feet of those he served. Nothing's changed, ladies and gentlemen. See, you have a king on the throne today who still bows low and takes your name to the Father in prayer. Because he knows in order to rise above, you've got to go beneath. You'll never serve over what you won't serve under. Come on, church. Let me throw this at you this morning. Where did Moses get that stick? Where did he get the stick? The things that we call trials. The things that we call wilderness. Come on, everybody. We don't understand why God allows them. We don't understand why we have to walk through them. But the stick came from the trial. Anytime God allows you to go through a desert experience. 
if he had never gone through the desert, he'd have never picked up that stick. Come on, come on. If he'd never picked up a stick, he'd never ha held it and it up. And the plagues of Egypt began in Exodus 7 through 12. He would have never come to set God's people free. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the plagues in Egypt were horrible to the Egyptians. They were life to the Hebrews. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What are you willing to let go? Come on, everybody. When you walk through a wilderness experience, God's not going to waste that experience. You can pick things up in that experience. And as you double back around in life, you'll be able to use those once again, again and again. And again, I, I, me and my wife, it was funny. We, we go to college out of high school. I, be, I, to become, I become a football coach. My wife becomes, she gets, she gets crazy in school. She's an overachiever. I just wanted another touchdown. <laughs> Smile at me. But my wife, instead of, instead of just an average business degree, she decides to, to double down. So she gets a business degree. She gets she gets a she gets a, a, a human resource management certificate. She she does all these things, and and we wonder why because after we got married, after college, I go into business. I got out of coaching because here's what I learned: it don't pay nothing. Smile at me. I still love to coach. Still volunteer to do that, stuff, but. My wife found out, we, years later, we're in ministry, and I look at Gail one day and I said, why did we, why did we do all that in school? And as we began to talk, what we realized is that all the effort that we put out in school, we used every day. What we learned there, we did every day. Because as, as, a, as my assistant, my administrator in the office, what did she do in, in the church? She recruited people. It's kind of a human resource management position. She was our business manager. Come on, everyone. All of the things that she had learned, God didn't just say, okay, that was, I'm sorry, you wasted your time. Look at me. Some of you recently have felt like, I feel like the Spirit of God's telling me to tell you this right now. Some of you have recently felt like what God has brought you through, what you've done, has literally been a waste of your time. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God will redeem all of the time. God will, God will redeem the time. And God will take what you've done. He'll take what you've learned. He'll take what you know. And he'll allow that to propel you forward. Come on, everybody. And not just, not just your kingdom, but his. But his. Remember in school the difference between when you were prepared for a test and then sometimes when you weren't? You remember that? You walk into a class and the teacher's like, all right, books under the table, everybody. We're going to take an exam. And sometimes you were like, I'm ready. Twice, I remember feeling that way. Two times. Most of the time I was like, oh, Lord Jesus. My prayer life got real good right then, right? <laughs> I remember those kids that would come in prepared, what they would act like. Oh, I got this. This is nothing. I believe that's how Moses walked in to talk to Pharaoh about leaving Egypt. Now, we know that he had a conversation with God about that. But I think by the time his feet hit the red carpet in Moses' house, he was ready. He walked into Pharaoh. He said, what do you, Pharaoh said, what do you want? Moses says, let, let God's people go. Let the, let, the, let, let the Hebrews go. And, and Pharaoh says, I'm not going to do that. Why would I listen to you? You're nobody. You're nothing. Moses says, watch this. And he throws that stick down on the ground. And it becomes a serpent. 
And I'm sure in that moment, Moses thought, I am God's man of the hour right now. Right? But the Bible says that, Mo, Mo, that the Pharaoh had magicians. Now listen carefully. And the Bible says that with, with trickery, the magicians did the same. Now, if I'm Moses, I'm like, oh, what do we do now? But listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. A magician can be a trickster. They can do things with trickery. But they can't do the supernatural. A magician uses deception and deceit and trickery and sleight of hand. But when the magicians of Pharaoh throw their sticks down, and those become serpents as well, but the stick that Moses threw down, come on, who knows the story, begins to swallow up the deception and the lie and the trickery and the deceit of all his house full. And what started with, with, with one snake ended with one snake. And I'm telling you right now, listen to me, church. This life started with one Lord, and it's going to end with one Lord. And there'll be a day that every knee bows, and that every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on. He's going to swallow up every lie. He's going to swallow up every deception. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, because he's the King of kings. He's above all others. Come on. It swallowed up the competition with supernatural success. We speak to business leaders in this place this morning. Some of you have dreamed, planned, prayed, worked, studied, organized. You've researched. You've put plans together. Listen to me. I believe without a shadow of, doubt, of a doubt, God is going to allow the plans that God has given you to begin to swallow up the competition with supernatural success. Now, how many of you would like to see God do that in your family? It's one thing to see it do it in the business. How about with your children? How about with the, with the extended family in your life that has still never come to know the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Savior and King? The greatest part in this miracle is not that God can take something ordinary and average and throw it down on the world stage and use it mightily and give it success. The greatest part of this miracle is that when God picked it back up, it turned into the same thing that it started out as. What are you talking about, Pastor Derek? That stick went right back to being a humble, normal, normal, ordinary, common, no better than anyone else. I'm no bigger than anybody else. I don't need more attention to anyone than anyone else. I'm just a stick. See, sometimes the most supernatural thing you can do after God uses you in a mighty way is just be normal again. For the love of God, we need normal Christians. If you're a weirdo Christian, stop. Stop. You can't give somebody the one-way sign with a Christian life bumper sticker on your car. That's hurting the brand. It's his brand. <laughs> We've all seen God use people in a mighty way and then they can't go back to being normal. Right? They suddenly walk different. They speak in King James, right? All their common language is now like poetry. You're like, just knock it off, goober, right? What's wrong with you? What's wrong? Am I, am I, am I saying that you shouldn't be marked 
and that God doesn't change your life? No. Obviously, God changes our life. Our life is in His hands. He can do whatever He wants with it. Just be useful in His hands. Maybe that's why we don't see more of supernatural. Because it's rare for God to take somebody and throw them down and they don't want to stay sensational. Can you sing on the worship team and serve behind the stage two weeks later? Or is that now beneath you? Can God trust you to preach one week and not run off and start your own thing down the street the next? See, there were some sticks that God used to part seas. There were others he used to be consumed in fire. They all have a purpose. They all provide something in the end. Come on, church. Can you be successful in the marketplace, but also serve the kids in kids' church? It's rare. I already mentioned this, but one of the signs of a healthy person is when they can lead from more than one chair. I've got a friend that pastors a church, and there's legitimately a rocket scientist in his church. He is a brilliant, brilliant man. He has worked and allowed our nation to be able to do things, even in outer space, that's just phenomenal things. If, if I were to tell you all the things, it'd blow your mind. But what's beautiful about this gentleman is that twice a month, he, he leads a preschool class. The other two Sundays a month, you'll find him in the parking lot with an orange vest on directing traffic. He's got multiple PhDs. Come on, everybody. But he's serving because that's where he's needed. Come on, church. Well, Pastor Eric, how do I know? How do I know if they need me to serve at church? Can you fog a mirror? Like, put your face. <sighs> yes, we need you. We may not need you on the preaching team yet. Come on. We may need you with an orange vest on. We might need you pouring Kool-Aid to little kids. How, 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 do I, how do I get involved? I'm sure there's lots of systems and ways you get involved in Christian life, okay? Yeah, I'm sure of that. Brian and Cindy are incredible with systems and, and planning those things, but here's, here's how we all learn. Show up early. Ask what needs to be done. Stay late. And do what you see. If you can help it, help it. Just every week, Margaret, you know, those chairs at church, they're just crooked every time we walk in. Every single week, those chairs. If somebody would just do, just fix the chairs, I think more people would come to Jesus. Dude, fix the chairs. We, I mean, do, do you need a, like a committee to meet or... A vote to be had? No, just fix the chairs. Sometimes God puts success on somebody's life and then we don't see him in church anymore. They get a boat and two vacation homes. Their kids on the Pee Wee International travel team. If that applies, here's how I put it. If, if the shoe fits, don't go home barefoot. None of those things are wrong. None of them are wrong. But when that becomes who you are, can God give you success and it not change who you are from when you started? No matter how high I take you, will you just always be a stick that God can use? That's what he's wondering. And by the way, he knows. He knows. That's why some of us still don't have. 
Come on. Some of us don't have the success that we're working toward because God knows what we'll do with it when we get it. Oh, that was good. I don't know if you wrote that down, but. I want you to understand something. God could have used a number of people to do what you're doing. Smile at me. You're like, I want Pastor Brian back. He loves on us. He does love you. I love you too. That's why I'm telling you the truth. Come on. God saw something in you. You're special to him. We need to get the fairness doctrine out of our mind. Quit desiring everything to be fair in life. You know what fair you know what fair means? That the kids down the street get the same Christmas gifts from me that my kids get. You know what my kids would think about that? They wouldn't feel very special, would they? Here's one thing I know that every one of my three kids feel that they are they are the favorite. You know why? Because we tell them they are. When the other two aren't around, we know. We're like, hey, hope you know. Oh, we know. We know. We know. Started at the bottom, now we're here. You know what I mean? God saw something in you. There's a stick spirit about you. God saw something in you. I wonder if God gave some of your businesses that innovate in that area of expertise, then those new practices go around the globe and change the business that you're in. I wonder if it would change your commitment to God. God, I've been praying, I've been working, I've been struck, I've been fine. I just, I wonder if God could trust us with great influence. I wonder if God would trust, if, if we would still show up to the things that matter so much to Him. Mark chapter 16, verse 18 says, In my name they shall take up serpents. Serpents in, in that time represented the supernatural power of God. In my name will they take up and do supernatural feats. Will they, will they have supernatural success? Remarkable things that I will trust them with. And it shall not hurt them. Most people don't get hurt with what they don't have. It's with what God gives them. We've got to understand, God wants to use us and bless the world with the gifts and abilities that he's given to us. God is looking for people that he can take and work through in a supernatural way. Would you be willing to say this morning, God use me. God use me. I will be a, I'll be a stick in your hand. Come on. I won't forget where I started. I just want, I want to increase your kingdom. I want to make heaven bigger. I want to make the church better. I can't find anywhere in scripture where God used that snake again. Thank God, huh? But boy, he sure used a stick. Some of you are this morning, you're like, are you serious? This guy came and all he's talking about is a stick? If that's where you are. If that's where you are at this point in the message, you have lost the grand idea. Come on, church. This is about something ordinary becoming something incredible. God sure used that stick again and again. As a matter of fact, in number 17, when God said, I need a high priest to represent me. He said, I want the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel to get a dead piece of wood disconnected from any life. I want them to cut it off, cut, cut a stick off of it and bring it into the Holy of Holies and place it in the Ark of the Covenant. 12 of them will write their names on it. Judah wrote his name on one. Aaron Wrote his name. I want you to write your names. And they put those sticks in the presence of God. And he said, the way, you will, the way that you will know the one I choose is that the stick that is cut down and dead, it will, become, it will come back to supernatural life. 
How many of you understand once a stick's cut off, it can't live again? But this stick, it'll start budding again. That will be the authentication for me that this is the person that I'm choosing as my leader. And they will start out as a dead stick, but I'm going to make them come to life again. Pastor Derek, how do you know that Jesus is the Lord and Savior? Listen to me. There are many religions. How do you know? How do you know that we need to go through Jesus? Because the test is still the same. God's plans haven't changed. You take Buddha, cut him down, put him in a tomb. Take Muhammad, cut him down, kill him, put him in a tomb. Take Confucius, take any of them, take New Age, put him in the tomb. They're still there. You take Jesus Christ, you nail him to a stick, you kill him, wound him, strip him, beat him, put him in a tomb, leave him, and the one who comes back to life again, he's the Lord and Savior. Come on, church. He's the King of Kings. That's how you know that he was God's choice. He's not one among many. He is God. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Check this out. In the old covenant, there was a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. God said, I want three things under that lid called the mercy seat. Three things. Number one, tablets of stone. Tablets of stone. That's the word of God. It's God's word. Put that in there. Put that in there. We need, we need the presence, the word of God. Come on, everybody. Number two, I want some living bread in there. What's that represent? That's the manna that God supplied. That's what's so amazing about this place. This is a church where God's presence is found. Come on. Where the presence of God is found, that's a sacred place. That manna, God said, it'll never grow old. It'll never spoil. Because everything lives in my presence. And lastly, God says this. I want to stick. Put Aaron's staff that budded after it was cut down. Put that stick in there. God says in James chapter 4, verse 6, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Instead of approaching God with, God, this is what I've done for you. God, you should be proud of me. God, I came to church today. I could have done other things. But I can't. God, if this is all these things I've done, instead of approaching God like that, if we approach him like, like the stick figures we are, ladies and gentlemen, just a stick man. I'm a wide stick man. Somebody tell the truth. Smile at me. God, I'm nothing without you. I'm nothing without him. God, you've been so good to me. I couldn't do any of this without you. I want to be usable in your hands. Is that your heart today? Is that the cry of your heart today? Come on, church. Is that who you are? Is that who your family, you desire for your family to be? God, make us usable in your hands. So God says, I will take you and I will use you again and again and again and again. For my kingdom's sake. Come on, church. Now, will there be tests? Absolutely. There's going to be tests, but God is saying, are you still one I can use? When the trials come, when the challenge exists, will you still be one I can use? If so, God will fill you again and again and again, and you'll go from faith to faith, 
from glory to glory, from miracle to miracle. Come on, church. Stand to your feet all over this room. God, it is our desire today to place ourselves in your hands once again. To be in your hands all over this room. Simple response to a simple message. Here it is. God, will you use me? I give myself to you to be used by you. I hold nothing back. This isn't a transactional relationship. I just simply place myself in your hands for you to do whatever you desire. Some of you, it's ministry. Some of you, it's your business. Some of you, it's your family. What have you been holding on to? You really haven't released to him. What have you, what have you just been holding on? Unto, will you say to God, God, this is what I need today. This is where I am. This is God's word to me today, to me personally. Or maybe today is the first time that you feel the sense and the presence that you need to give your life to Jesus. Can I just tell you, the best decision you'll ever make in any part of your life is that you surrender your life to the one Jesus Christ. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask those of you who've, through this service, you just felt God tugging on your heart saying, this is for you. This is for you. This is for you. Those of you that are here that would say, you know what, I want to ask God to do, to, to, to make me useful in his hands. It's his choice what it is. God, I make, I, I make myself available to be useful in your hands. I don't hold anything back. God, I give it to you.